Today's Fire Emblem Three Houses video focuses on 10 more trivia or occurrences the player may or may not have seen or experienced, or even realized it themselves when it happened. Those who are incredibly knowledgeable of the game's quirkier bits ought to recognize some of these. But some are so random and obscure that even I wasn't aware of most of them. Literally, some of these I've tried myself for the first time, and I was pretty shocked that these were in the game and I've never tried, let alone known they were even things to get. Pretty short and casual video for today just like last week. Anyway, if any of these tidbits are those you never knew yourself, comment down below which ones they were. And if you know some random Three Houses trivia that ends up not being mentioned here, let us know down below. Many of these selections for this video were inspired by commenters of the last one, so thank you for sharing your thoughts. Asar Research Group while most of the game's battalions can be obtained in a straightforward way, as in buying them from the battalion's guild, some of them require a more unorthodox approach, such as completing quests, beating paralogues, or even having specific units get near one specific tile on a specific story map. And then there is the Esar Research Group. Unlike every other battalion in the game, this one can be obtained by completing four online liaison recon missions, three in-game weeks in a row. So if this is your first time hearing about it, you now know why. Is it worth all the trouble to get though? Well, it can be obtained very early on if you can connect online. The boons it gives you are quite solid for being an E-rank battalion, and the gambit it comes with gives everyone the chance to survive a lethal hit once. So, maybe yeah. Replacements abound. If you have purchased the game's expansion pass, you'll likely know that the Anna that can be recruited as a unit also happens to be the one that opens her secret shop by chapter 15 on all routes, with or without the DLC. If playing in classic mode, this also means that she can potentially die in battle, which can make one wonder what happens to her shop in that case. Assuming Anna fell in battle, Three Houses solves this issue by having Anna's shop be run by, not one of her identical sisters, as the franchise's lore would make you think, but by a small girl who idolizes Anna and wants to follow her footsteps. If Anna died before the shop gets to open, this little girl even becomes the one that gives you the quest to open it instead. Linked Attacks Besides three houses having a traditional support system for their characters, the game also introduced something called Linked Attacks. In a nutshell, there are specific units that, when paired together, get an extra boost in might during battle rather than just the usual boons in hit and avoid. These can go from plus one with no support to plus three with an A support, and in Byleth's case, who can access S support via New Game Plus, they can gain up to plus five. These boosts are also applied when using the Agitant feature, which is quite handy. It's worth repeating from my previous video that while linked attacks were coded for the pairs of Bernadetta and Marianne, Dorothea and Hilda, their lack of support in the final game means that as far as the game is concerned, they don't get any support boons whatsoever. Paralogue scaling and maddening. Besides all the changes maddening difficulty brings to the game, increased levels, more skills to enemies, more enemies for maps, and so on, there is one that can potentially catch players off guard. More so if they avoid playing paralogues at the start for the sake of doing them later with better stats, abilities, and classes. Difficulty scaling. For you see, most of the game's paralogues have a difficulty scaling system implemented in maddening difficulty, meaning the levels of the enemies fought on it will increase as the story goes on by a few levels. There is good news though. For starters, not every paralogue is affected, and second, the level scaling does stop at a certain point, so it's relatively possible to overprepare yourself for them. Edelgard and Claude's A-Rank Storylines both Edelgard and Claude share the common distinction of having one unique line for their root stories, which is only used if their support with Byleth has reached A by then. Edelgard's line is present near the very end of Crimson Flower, in the event Stolen Time. Meanwhile, Claude's happens right before Chapter 20, in the event The Archbishop's Whereabouts. There are things I want to see with you someday. I'll keep thinking about the best way to achieve that goal. You are the one person in this world who can share the heavy burden I must carry. Someone without equal, who I can always speak my mind to. Dimitri's root sadly has no equivalent for this, though that doesn't mean it doesn't come without its own trivia. Byleth's birthday in Azur Moon. Normally, the game celebrates Byleth's birthday by having their chosen house leader gift them both a letter and a unique accessory that can grant anyone plus two charm when equipped. This begs the question though, what about Azur Moon's case? I mean, at the start of part two, Dimitri goes on full bore mode and it's unlikely he's gonna care about birthdays during this phase. Right? Also, since Rhea is a non-entity after the time skip and Flane has no plot armor in Blue Lions, I can't blame you for imagining the route might choose to 
not celebrate your birthday. But if you thought so, then I am glad to tell you that you're wrong. Because here is where Gilbert comes into the rescue. If Byleth's birthday was set between the 1st of January, Garland Moon, and the 30th of March, Great Tree Moon, in Azur Moon, Gilbert will be the one that wishes you a happy birthday in a letter. The Silver Maiden's Easter Egg. Japan only. At the end of Dimitri's paralogue, The Silver Maiden, there's some dialogue which got lost in translation that affects one interesting dialogue choice. When Byleth goes to pick up Dimitri to celebrate the fort's capture, in Japanese, Byleth is given the option to jokingly call him a hikikomori, which is a term used for social recluses. If this prompt was picked, Dimitri's reply actually changes depending on whether Bernadetta was recruited and is still alive in the party or not, as he will claim he is nothing like her in such case. While the triggers for this change still exist in the international script of Three Houses, the dialogue was changed so there's no longer allusions to the term, and, as a response, both of Dimitri's potential responses were made the same, regardless if Bernadetta was recruited or not. So, Professor, I have been doing all of the talking, but I assume you came here for a reason. <laughs> Steal me away? That seems rather unnecessary. で、先生、こちらの話ばかりしてしまったのは何か用があったのだろう。俺は別に引きこもっているわけではベルナデッタでもあるまし。the Tathlum Bow. The Tathlum Bow is an A-rank sacred bow that is enhanced when the wearer has the Crest of Lamine by gradually healing them considerably. It's also available only in Azur Moon, and it's quite easy to miss due to how specific the process of getting it actually is. For one, the weapon can only be obtained in Chapter 18 aka the map where you fight Cornelia. Second, the westernmost enemy warlock on the map using a fire orb, plus the giant robot next to it on hard and maddening difficulty, has to be defeated. And third, one of your units has to enter the 3x3 square where a grappler is slash was located on the northern side of the map. If all three conditions were met, then a level 50 sniper holding the bow will pop up next to the fire orb where that warlock just was, and will begin fleeing towards the map's exit. Defeat it before it escapes, and the bow is all yours. Hegemon Edelgard, Sniper Extraordinaire. This one's on the short side, but in Azur Moon's endgame, the crest stone weapon Hegemon Edelgard uses for sniping your units from far away actually changes a bit depending on the difficulty you're playing on. If it's in normal, the weapon has 45 hit and 27 range. In hard, it has 50 hit and 30 range. And in maddening, it's raised to 60 hit and 32 range. Factor in how her stats rise along with the difficulty, and Hegemon Edelgard's absurd long range attacks can go from being a complete joke to a very scary nuisance that would make her playable self from Fire Emblem Heroes proud. Nemesis Nemesis, the Vincible. As the final boss of Verdant Wind, Nemesis has the unique gimmick of buffing up his stats to an insane degree thanks to his supports from the 10 elites. And due to this, the game expects the player to knock them down first before fighting the big man himself. Given all the tools Three Houses gives to the player, however, it's no surprise people have found a workaround behind Nemesis's invincibility. The most common strategy requires some planning in advance before setting up the kill with the unit of your choice. The unit that has the easiest time pulling this off by far is, to no one's surprise, Lysithia. Thanks to the combination of her sky-high 60% magic growth and access to the Luna spell, which bypasses the enemy's resistance entirely. Beef up her offenses with magical battalions, for example Ordelia's Sorcery Co. and the Timotheos Magic Core can raise her magic up by plus 8, while the Macule Evil Repelling Co. raises it by plus 7. Skills like Fiendish Blow and Dark Tome Fair, the latter which can be stacked up, Defiant Magic and Rally Magic, plus equipping a magic staff, and Lysithia can gain up to plus 39 magic. And given Nemesis always has 107 HP regardless of the difficulty, Lysithia only needs a minimum of 68 magic to one hit KO Nemesis, which can be reached with some Divine Pulse abuse and tons of stat boosters. Of course, that's just as far as Lysithia's case is concerned, because as long as any unit can accumulate a ton of raw power, as this warrior Mercedes shows, rigging a critical hit against Nemesis is also a viable strategy. As for setting up the kill, the best way to do so is by either warping your nuke to Nemesis, or by luring him out of his heal tile so he loses his increased avoid and defenses, which can be done safely with a Ballista and an Onager located at the middle of the map. Alternatively, sending one unit to bait him also works. Incidentally, combining both the Impregnable Wall Gambit or even the Ballistas with any unit with Poison Strike ability also helps in chipping Nemesis's HP and raising the odds of nailing the KO. That will do it for today's video. 
Like I said at the beginning, if any of these tidbits are those you never knew yourself, comment down below which ones they were. And if you know some random Three Houses trivia that ends up not being mentioned here, let us know down below. The ones I did not know coming off the heels of last week's video and into this one were the SR Research Group and literally the entire recon training minigame in general. I've never actually done this before in all of my hundreds of hours playing this game and I was kind of floored that this minigame was in here the entire time and I never bothered with it. I I also didn't even know the Taltham bow existed or how to get it. The ones I was really truly familiar with were the A supports and like killing Nemesis the hard way. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like down below. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing that. Almost two thirds of the people who watch my content haven't subscribed, which is honestly a lot. It's free and it helps support the channel reach the ultimate 100,000 subscriber goal. And thank you everyone from last week who subscribed. Thank you as always to my patrons as well. Your consistent support enormously helps me stay afloat and able to continue pursuing content creation full time. If you want to join the Patreon, click the link below. Starting soon, I'm going to be hosting Patreon only Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl and Smash Brothers Ultimate Tournaments for the Mercenary Patreon tier and higher. I want to live stream these little tournaments of ours too. And there's a small number of us who play these games together and when we do play with each other, we really enjoy it. If you like either game and you want to start participating in these sessions or tournaments in the future, all you need to do is subscribe to the Mercenary tier. And at the very least, you get to be part of the Patreon community that I've been able to have for the last three or four years. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for everything. And that'll do it for today. Deuces.